Hello everyone, welcome to lecture um, 14 and 15 and for these two lectures we are going to focus on economic globalization and also rising inequalities. Um, so what is economic globalization or uh, also known as neoliberal globalization? Generally people refer um, economic globalization to the increased flow of three items, um, increased trades and flow of goods, um, increased flow of capital, and also increased flow of technology. So um, I'm bringing you back to a very familiar sites that we have here. Um, so I'm um, remembering that in the first few lectures when I was talking about modernization theories and dependency theories, I've shown you these slides. And then uh, remember at that time when we talk about sustainable developments um, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, we also talk a little bit about neoliberalizations or a neoliberal order. So we can see that in the 1980s, the neoliberal order is just rising and, and together with participatory and inclusive approaches, right? Um, even though it doesn't seem so, but actually both of this um, has um, a common um, emphasis on individual liberty or can be interpreted um, that way. And also in the 1990s, um, we have neoliberalization and uh, worldwide structural adjustments um, facilitated by development actors such as the World Bank and also International Monetary Fund. So now I want to talk a little bit more about the idea of neoliberalism. And uh, many people actually draw from David Harvey, who is a British-born economic uh, geographer um, who has written a lot uh, about neoliberalism and has been widely cited. And he's now working in the City University of New York. Uh, and so according to Harvey, what is neoliberalism? Um, so he says that neoliberalism is the maximization of entrepreneurial freedoms within an institutional framework of private property rights, individual liberty, unencumbered markets, and free trade. So what do we mean by um, this is that uh, neoliberalism is the idea of believing in um, free trade and businesses, but this uh, freedom of trading must be protected by a recognition of private property rights. So government should have institutions that recognize and protect private property rights and individual liberty. Um, and they really mean this by the individual freedom to accumulate properties, right? Um, and then uh, unencumbered markets also require state interventions and then minimizing trade barriers to encourage free trade. So neoliberalism is not really asking for no state intervention at all. It actually asks for active state intervention to protect all of this so that there could be no interventions in uh, the actual trade itself. And of course, the actual practices um, frequently diverge from this idea of neoliberalism, um, especially by developed nations, because countries still um, provide subsidies um, to support the production, such as in the US, they have highly subsidized agriculture industry, causing food dumping in other parts of the world, as we have mentioned in the last lecture. And then, um, Harvey says that neoliberalism has really become hegemonic uh, by looking at how almost all state in the world has signed on to the World Trade Organizations and uh, International Monetary Fund and agreed to abide by the neoliberal rules or face severe penalties. So um, neoliberal ideas have spread to multiple ways. But um, in the cases of poor countries, um, there is actually um, a significant role played by the structural adjustment. I've already mentioned that um, two of the main actors of um, structural adjustment is um, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which is a major development actors. And um, both of these um, bodies um, borrow money, um, especially targeting developing countries to help in their investment and infrastructure projects. 
And um, a lot of this money are given in the form of loans. Some of them are given um, in the form of grant, but also some of them require repayment with interest rate, maybe sometimes at a lower interest rate than market rate. So the role of structural adjustment. Um, so poor countries were in debt crisis in the 1980s. I think we mentioned this before. And so um, for them to um, continue to have low interest lending and also um, to fulfill the conditions to have some debt relief um, through the ESAF, which is the Enhanced Structural Adjustment Facilities and HIPC in Initiative, which is highly indebted poor countries. Bodies like um, the World Bank and IMF has um, imposed structural adjustments or maybe um, put structural adjustment as a condition for countries to benefit from um, a low interest lending and debt relief. Um, and um, the structural adjustment had since faced um, widespread criticisms. If you Google uh, on structural adjustment today, most of them are rather negative. And there are three kinds of criticisms. Number one is it really harm the poor, the harm the poorest people the most, and it contributes to environmental degradation as well as it's undemocratic. But what is structural adjustment program exactly? Right, so, um, so structural adjustment programs require countries to do the following. Number one is the reduction in government spending, so fiscal austerity. So you should not um, um, provide too much in terms of public spending, education, health, and whatever spending that usually the government support. And then also monetary tightening, you should increase your interest rates and then control the credits that you give. And a market-based pricing, meaning that you should eliminate um, subsidies for items or popular consumptions and, and have it um, based on the market prices. And that's also privatization of public sector, such as water, electricity, utilities, um, medicine, education, and also capital liberalization and encouragement of foreign direct investment. So meaning that you should um, liberalize the rules um, to allow foreign capital to come in and invest uh, at the same time also allowing them to leave, allowing capital to flow in and out freely and also asking them to really um, create the conducive environment to attract foreign direct investment. And this has been um, associated with the criticism of how neoliberalization has um, created the race to the bottom, uh, especially among poor countries, because in order to facilitate and attract foreign direct investment, sometimes you want to um, lower your um, labor regulations and also environmental regulations so that um, companies uh, will come and relocate their businesses or investment in your country because it's much easier to comply to the rules. And also sometimes um, it is in the form of tax break um, and protections um, or, or special privilege given by the government. Uh, minimal trade barriers. So um, if in the past, before the 1980s, uh, countries might have a lot of protection mechanism to protect businesses in the country, such as um, imposing import tariffs or tax um, on consumers on imported goods or subsidize the productions of local goods so that um, consumers will actually buy more of the local products than foreign products so in this way protecting the local goods but um, under structure adjustment program um, you should actually um, take away all these um, so-called trade barriers and allow really so-called free trade to function so um, foreign products and local products are competing in the same um, level field and so i have asked you in one of your class reading to read about an article on structural adjustment program assessment in african countries so um, they have very focused objective here they're trying to see whether structural adjustment program actually achieve what they say that they will achieve um, so they look at economic growth, number one, from, from 1991 to 1995, and they discovered that of, of all countries involved in the structural adjustment program, there's an average of 0% GDP growth. And Sub-Saharan Africa actually experienced a minus 0.3% of GDP growth. And, um, and other developing nations, which is not involved in um, structural adjustment program, has an average of 1% GDP growth. In terms of education and health spending, it is observed that there is actually a minus 0.7% in education spending annually for African countries. 
there is a rise of 2.5% annually in health spending, but that still lag behind other countries not involved in the structural adjustment program. And finally, uh, on external debt, uh, remember that structural assessment, sorry, structural adjustment program is actually uh, a condition for countries in order to um, receive debt relief. So how are these countries doing in terms of the external debt? Um, you can see that there's a rise of um, debt from 71.1% to 87.8% of GNP for involved countries and um, compared to 34% um, to 39.6% for developing countries overall. And for Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the rise is from 58% to 70%. So you can see that really there is no economic growth. That is um, not sufficient or reduced education and health spending, as well as a rising external debt. So that is why you can see that um, structural adjustment programs have been widely criticized today, um, and this is evidence based. And then I just want to show you this um, table, which is also in the reading. So this table, I think, is illuminating in terms of showing how money flows between the IMF and Sub-Saharan Africa. So IMF purchases means the loan made by IMF to African countries. Repurchases means the repayment by countries to IMF. IMF charges means the interest rates being charged on the loan they borrow to the lend out to the African countries. And balance here really shows how much money is flowing between IMF and African countries. So minus means um, money is flowing from the African countries to IMF and um, positive means there is a positive flow of money from IMF to African countries. And you can see that in most of the years is really minus. So in 1997 and 1998, really um, African countries have paid a lot to IMF, um, more than $1 billion. Um, but even that, um, the African countries still have rising debt after 1998. And remembering in our first lecture that we talk about actually there's a net financial flow from developing countries to developed countries, this is one of the reasons why loan repayment with interest rates. So the United States actually plays a role in the spreading of neoliberal ideas. One of the major repeating points of neoliberal advocates is that it is an emphasis on individual liberty and freedom. Particularly, they are talking about individual freedom to gain prosperity, accumulate wealth, and accumulate property, the typical American dream. And also, the argument is that if you have a diffuse power through private properties, that will ensure a society of freedom compared to centralized power hold in the hands of the government. Many would also argue that um, the power is not really that diffuse, it's actually concentrated in the hands of a few non-government private citizens who are extremely rich. But this, this appeal has been quite useful to push the idea forward, right? So, um, for example, for the Iraq war, uh, they actually talk about um, the idea of bringing freedom and liberty to Iraq, to the Iraqi people. And after the Iraqi war, you really see um, there is a pushing of market fundamentalism. So, um, I highlighted some of the texts in um, Harvey's discussions. There is uh, the promulgation of four orders that included the full privatization of public enterprises, full ownership rights by foreign firms of Iraqi U.S. businesses, full repatriations of foreign profits, the opening of Iraq's banks to foreign control, national treatment for foreign companies, and the elimination of nearly all trade barriers. So these are the two actors that are closely associated with the idea of neoliberalism. Um, the first one of them is Ronald Reagan, um, the President of the United States, um, during that time. And uh, among one of his famous quotes is that the problem is not that people are taxed too little, the problem is that government spend too much. And then we have also British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher at the time, 
and she was saying that oh there is really no alternative apart from market economy so people even um, consolidate that is no alternative as Tina because it becomes such a famous quote so as I google for Margaret Thatcher um, image to show you here I also saw this and so I wanted to show you here he said hell is now being privatized so it's a mockery of Margaret Thatcher of wanting to privatize everything so before ending this part of the lecture um, I just want to pose some questions as usual to give you a break and uh, rethink about what we have listened to and tell some of your opinions so do you think it is necessary for countries to cut their spending to repay debt who do you think benefit the most from that repayment of countries if you are a negotiator representing the indebted countries, what would you propose? So after this part of the lecture, I will direct you to a very short news video um, about IMF um, still trying to uh, impose certain kind of structure adjustment even um, today um, on some of the countries that it has um, lent money to.